What's up, everyone? What is up? I am killing some time. Hey guys, thanks for joining. Just gonna um, answer a few questions while I am waiting on a gift for my wife to be completed because tomorrow is our five year wedding anniversary. Super excited. Um, so I'm just sitting here in the mall waiting. So let's take some questions. Thank you so much. Predestination. So before I answer that, can you just kind of clarify to me, um, what do you mean? by predestination because some people have different thoughts and I don't want to answer a question that you're not asking. Uh, so tell me uh, what you mean by predestination and then I'll tell you what I think about it. Kristoff asked, is it sparkly? I can't tell you that. I don't know if she's watching or if she'll see this by tomorrow. Okay, while I'm waiting, let me answer this question. Uh, Stacy, thanks for asking. She says, hi Shane, I got caught up in a bad gambling habit, financially destroyed myself. Will God help me even though I did this to myself? Yes, he will. He will help you. Now, that doesn't mean that um, you won't have natural consequences because even though there's forgiveness, and even though there's grace and mercy, um, there can still very well be consequences for our actions, for our sin. And so on an eternal level, we can know that we're forgiven, but on a natural level here on the earth, we gotta understand there's things we might uh, have to walk through just because of our disobedience and our, you know, our actions. And so, will God help you? Yes, he will, but the way he helps you might not look like you know, how you might think. It doesn't mean that God's going to drop a check into your bank account because you're sorry. Uh, but it will look like God redeeming and restoring um, these, these thought processes and these ways of living that you have. You know, what's better, uh, getting out of debt or getting free from bondage? Getting free from bondage, right? And so I believe your heart is to not gamble and to be free and God will absolutely set you free from that um, and give you a new way of thinking and, and help you to live free from any type of addiction or bondage and I also believe he will give you wisdom um, to get yourself out of any financial hardship that you've been put in as a result of this and so just know God is concerned with your finances because he's a perfect father but he's far more concerned with your heart and uh, if your heart is right, then uh, that's a great place to be. Okay. Do I believe someone is born going to heaven or hell? No, I don't. Um, well, let me clarify that. What, what you're really asking, I believe, is does God choose people to go to hell and to go to heaven? No, I don't believe that. The Bible teaches that we are born on a wide road of destruction. We are born enemies of God, cut off from God, alienated and wicked in our minds towards him. That's Colossians 1 and many other places in the Bible talk about this. But the Bible says he gave us the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name. The Bible says that it's God's desire that none shall perish. So if God chose people to go to hell, then he would be lying if he said that it's his desire that no one goes to hell. Well, God's not a liar. The, the, the theology of God selecting and electing people to go to heaven and to go to hell, it's false. That's Calvinism. I don't follow John Calvin. I follow Jesus. I follow the Bible. 
And the Bible says that Jesus came for the whole world and that he gave everyone the ability to say yes to him, but he also gave everyone the ability to reject him. And that's why people go to hell is they reject God. It's not because God chooses for them to do so. Um, I remember a while back, you used to post videos a lot of casting out demons. Would you still walk in this as often? Um, I do. Um, I would say it's not as frequent as it was, and that's because when I was posting all those videos, I was on a 44 city nationwide tour where I was literally casting out demons almost every single night of that tour. Um, now, you know, I, I preach a lot in churches, I preach at events, I preach at camps, and um, there are deliverances that happen, but it hasn't been quite as extreme as it was. And, you know, I'm not a deliverance minister, like I don't run after deliverance. I'm a, I'm a preacher filled with the Holy Spirit, and I do whatever the Holy Spirit asks me to do whenever He asks me to do it. So some days it might be healing, some days it might be deliverance, some days it might be prophecy, some days it might be all of the above. Um, but I have done deliverance here and there. I just don't always have it on video. And, you know, sometimes it might be better that way so that I don't get a big head. Because I'm not awesome because I do deliverance. God is awesome. Um, thank you guys for congratulating us on our anniversary. We're super excited. What group was I with? I was with First Special Forces Group. How do you help your spouse take their head out of the sand and realize what real Christianity is instead of the cookie cutter Christian lifestyle that's comfortable? All right. Um, someone is upset at their spouse. <laughs> I can just tell by the way you're typing that that you're, you've got frustration towards them. And while I understand, I want to encourage you like, if someone is deceived, they don't understand that they're deceived. And um, if someone is ignorant to something, then our job is to bring them truth, not beat them over the head with it or make them feel dumb or something like that. So just be careful with your heart. I could be totally misjudging your, your message, but just kind of by some of the things that you said, it seems like, you know, it could be really easy to look down on Christians who aren't, you know, on fire for God and that's not our heart is to look down on people especially our spouse our spouses we're one with them we're a team um, but to kind of answer your question um, the older you get people value words less they look at your life lived I don't really care about what you say I want to see what you do and I believe that um, being the example for your spouse of what uh, a life in Christ really looks like is going to be convicting and it's going to speak louder than any sermon or any podcast you could ever have them listen to. So make sure that you're being the hands and feet of Jesus. Make sure that you are showing the love of Jesus. Make sure that the fire of God is burning inside of you and it gets out. And that will be convicting to a, you know, cookie cutter Christian, so to speak. Uh, your son lent you the book I wrote. So grateful. Hey, thanks. Thanks for reading it. I'm getting sick of dudes praying with their shirts off. How do you feel about that? I hate it with the passion. You know, it's so funny. And I think about it like this. When I was skinny, like when I was... 5'10", 140 pounds. If my shirt was off, nobody seemed to care. I lived in Florida. We hung out with our shirts off all the time. But I will notice, or I have noticed that when I begin powerlifting and when I put on some muscle, all of a sudden, when I take my shirt off, it could be inappropriate at some times. And I even heard that. I felt that conviction from the Lord. And... Um, I think there's just a, a concept of living above reproach and maintaining this image, not a superficial, like ego, prideful type image, but maintaining an image of godliness and holiness and just understanding that, 
you know what? If I post videos with my shirt off, that could be a stumbling block for someone. Um, not even trying to make any comment this way or that way, just saying like it's something you have to think about. Right now, this live, there, there's nothing for you to have to think about except what I'm saying. But like if I, if I had my shirt off, well now all of a sudden in your head, you're like, why does this guy have a shirt off or whatever? It's, un, it's unnecessary to do. It would be like if I did this live and I was drinking a beer. I'm not saying that drinking beer is bad, but now that's something you've got to think about and you've got to wrestle with and you're wondering about me and drinking. That's why I just don't drink at all. I don't do any of that. And so I don't hate on people who make videos with their shirts off. Um, but I will say, I think it's not the wisest thing to do. I think you're distracting from your message and it could easily cause people to think that there's a different motive, you know? Um, if you want the prayer to solely be about the prayer, then, then don't be a distraction. Put a shirt on. Now, here's another uh, angle of that. You know, what if someone lives like in Hawaii or they live on the ocean and they're just always hanging with their shirt off? That's who they are. Maybe that's part of their culture. Again, I can't make a blanket statement. All I can say is living above reproach, trying to consider what could be a stumbling block for others. Personally, I'm not a fan when dudes make videos with shirts off that are praying or trying to talk about God. I think it's a little distracting. Um, but I will not judge someone's heart because I don't know their motive and I don't want to assume a motive on someone that's impure when their, their heart could be totally pure. They're just making a, a bad judgment call maybe, you know, I hope that makes sense. Can you lose your salvation? Uh, no, I don't think that you can lose it such as, you know, in the way that you could lose a set of keys. I do believe you can reject your uh, walk with the Lord. You can walk away from Him and never return. I think that you can turn your back on God, but God is faithful. He will never turn His back on us. The Bible says that no one can snatch us from His hand, but I do believe that you can walk away from Him. Um, and if you walk away, you were never saved in the first place. So this is why I believe Jesus said, He who endures to the end will be saved. Paul said... Um, if you continue in the faith and you don't depart from the gospel which you heard. People can depart from the gospel which they heard. Don't you know that? Like, don't you know people that have left the faith? I do. And uh, so I just believe if you left, you were never really saved. You know, you were riding a high or you were trying something out. But the Bible teaches that when trials come, when temptations come, when deceitfulness of riches comes in, people decide to go a different direction. So... I don't think you can lose salvation, but I think you can reject it. Okay. Uh, can a believer in Christ who's been baptized be saved if they die, even if they're fornicating with their significant other? Okay, this is quite an interesting question. Um, so I think they're asking if you die in sin... Are you still saved? Now remember, we're not saved because we live a perfect life. We're saved by grace through faith alone. So it is only because of our faith in Jesus that we are saved, which means that if you sin, you're not all of the sudden unsaved. Now the question becomes, well, what if it's a habitual sin? What if I'm sinning on purpose? I know I shouldn't do it, but I just can't help myself. Well. I, don't, I can't answer that. I don't know. Um, Jesus says, if you love me, you'll keep my commands. And so I wonder at what point do you really love God if you can continue to sin and sin and sin and sin and sin? Um, the only comfort I would take if you're stuck in a sin is if it grieves your heart. If it grieves you when you miss it and you feel corrected and you feel convicted when you miss it, you know, I would make an argument that God is fathering you, but you need to have some serious self-control and discipline in your life. But, you know, if, if, uh, if like say on the way home I get cut off and all of a sudden I just decide to cuss out the person who cut me off in the car and as I'm cussing them out I get in a car crash and die, I don't think I'm going to go to hell. I won't go to hell. I, I committed a sin, but 
my salvation is not based on my ability to be sinless. My salvation is based on Jesus' ability to be sinless and my faith in him and because of what he did on the cross. So I hope that answers your question. Um, usually, I'll just be honest, people ask that when they are living in sin and they're trying to get some type of comfort because they're tormented mentally because they're doing something they know they shouldn't be doing and they're worried about going to hell. I would just say, stop sinning. Stop doing the things that God hates. Thank you guys for joining in and, and uh, watching. This is cool. How do I let go of anger I have towards God and the fear and sense of rejection I have from Him? Well, um, you are not rejected by God. That's the truth. You've been accepted by God. The Bible says that Christ died while you were a sinner. If God was going to reject you, he would have done it already, but he didn't. He saw who you were, who you were meant to be, made in his image, and Jesus paid the price to redeem your life. So, first, first answer is you are not rejected by God. You might feel rejected, and maybe that's because things haven't gone your way, but you're not actually rejected. Um, the Bible talks about fear. We haven't been given a spirit of fear. So if you're feeling fear, then it's either demonic from the enemy or it's a lack of understanding. What I mean is this. The Bible says that fear has to do with torment. It has to do with punishment. And that uh, perfect love casts out all fear. And so if you're afraid, you haven't been perfected in love. You haven't understood God's love for you. And you still think that God is someone to be afraid of. And uh, I want to encourage you in that area. If you're a Christian, God is your father. He's not, he's not coming to damn you to hell or condemn you for your sin. He loves you. He wants you to, to live uh, the life that he called you to live. And that anger towards him, there's many reasons you could have anger towards him, but one of the most popular reasons people are angry with God is, again, because life didn't go the way they hoped it would. And maybe you even prayed. Maybe you even prayed and you didn't get an answer, and so you feel like you have the right to be angry with God. But let me tell you, um, God did not create man to have all his prayers answered and to have a perfect life. God created man in his image, and your job is to walk uh, this life out that Jesus paid for, to, to run this race and fight this good fight of faith, and keep believing, even when the enemy comes and tries to steal, kill, and destroy in your life. We actually don't have the right to be angry with God because we deserve death and he gave us life. So if you're angry with God, it just means your perspective is on you. It's on yourself and you're unhappy. And uh, that's the first issue is you're thinking about yourself. So you have to get your mind off of you and back onto God. Begin to thank him for saving you when you didn't even deserve it. There's no way to be angry at that. Are we living in the last days? I believe we've been in the last days since Jesus ascended to heaven. Ever since he ascended, we've been waiting for his second return. Um, hey, Alex. Love you, man. What is God showing me in this season? God is showing me the Father's heart in a way that I've never experienced. I feel more tender than I ever have in my entire life. Honestly, I've never cried so much as I have in the last like week and a half. It's been wild. I just feel God's love as a father. Um, I'm receiving that from him and I'm feeling it for others. And it's just been such a special time. And honestly, I'm just hoping that that never goes away. What I'm feeling right now, because it's just a very tender place where I just feel like at the drop of a hat, I could just lose it. And um, it's refreshing because life has hardened me. You know, I've seen a lot. I've been through a lot. I've experienced a lot. Hard stuff. And, and I've had to function in very dysfunctional scenarios. And in order to do that, and on some level, you have to harden yourself. You have to compartmentalize. And it can be very hard to reverse that and become tender again. 
And, uh, but it's easy for God. And I've been praying for God to tenderize me and he seriously has been. And I'm just so grateful. So uh, it's been amazing. Was just diagnosed with a rare tumor behind my left eardrum. Please keep me in your prayers. Everyone, let's pray right now for Lisa. Lisa, I want you to put your hand on your left ear. And we're just going to pray. And I just believe God's going to take that thing out. Lord, I thank you in the name of Jesus that this tumor in the eardrum would leave right now. In Jesus' name. I speak to this ear. I say, be healed. Every tumor, go now. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Listen, I'm seeing a couple of comments on tongues. Go watch Derek Prince video on tongues on YouTube. I watched that video and my mind was just, I learned so much and I got the gift of tongues right there in the car. I was in traffic. I was watching the video. They did an activation prayer and I began to speak in tongues right there. So if someone could comment that, um, I don't, I don't want to type right now just because of how I'm sitting. Someone write Derek Prince tongues. Um, that's what you need to go listen to. Um, I don't believe that wrestling in itself is a sin. Um, now, there are things, there are components of it that could become sinful, like pride, um, like arrogance, like... Um, yeah, those are, those are really big ones, especially if you're talking about WWE and stuff where it's a lot of acting. You could quickly get into a fleshly place. But the act of wrestling, I don't believe is a sin. I wrestled for 15 years. I, I don't think so. It's a sport. What do you say to people who say Christians cop out of everything by just saying everything is God's plan and God's will, no matter how good or bad it is? Um, I do think that. I don't think it's always a cop out. I honestly think many people are uninformed. They're ignorant to it. Um, they don't understand God's will. Here's what I mean. Not everything that happens is the will of God. Look at suicide. Suicide is not God's will. On an even bigger level, how about people that go to hell? I just said earlier, the verse, it is God's desire that none shall perish. God doesn't want anyone to go to hell. But do people go to hell? Yes, they do. God wants everyone to be saved, but is everyone saved? No, they aren't. They reject him. Even going back to Cain and Abel, it was God's desire that uh, Cain would give an offering to the Lord. And he didn't give a good offering. God didn't get his way. Not everything that happens is the will of God. And that's because we have free will. And for it to be true free will, you have to be able to reject God. You have to be able to disobey. Otherwise, it's not actually free will. So most people don't know that. And they just say, whatever happens is God. And um, you know what else? God gets credited for a lot of things that the devil did or that humans did. Because if everything is God's will, then all the bad things that happen must be his will too. No. Jesus came and taught us there's an enemy out there stealing, killing, and destroying. And uh, it's important that we recognize that. Does your wife have any pregnancy guides? Um, so we follow pain-free birth. Check them out on Instagram. Pain Free Birth. Uh, the woman's name who runs it is Karen. She's amazing. And uh, we were actually just watching some classes today. That is a very helpful birth program. Does God heal acne and scars? Yes, he does. I've seen self-harm scars, cutting scars disappear. Like more than once. God is so good. I'll pray for you right now. Um... Pray for your acne and scars if this is for you. Father, I thank you in the name of Jesus that at the sound of my voice, every bit of acne and scarring from acne be healed right now in Jesus' name. 
skin be healed, you be clear right now in the name of Jesus. I command every issue of acne to leave this person in Jesus' name, just because you love them. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Should I be rebaptized if I was baptized as an infant in the Catholic Church? Um, infant baptism doesn't do anything. Doesn't serve a purpose. I think it's cool for parents to dedicate their kids to the Lord, and I think that that is that's awesome. You know, that's parents saying, "Hey, we're gonna we're gonna raise our kids in the way of the Lord." But to baptize a, a baby that doesn't do anything. Baptism doesn't save you. Uh, baptism is a choice that you have to make. Baptism is a command that you have to follow. Just like you can't get your parents' salvation, you have to have your own. Getting dunked in a little tank or, gosh, during COVID, I saw some Catholic priests like shooting babies with squirt guns because they were afraid to get, I mean, it's ridiculous. Infant baptism doesn't do anything. When you get born again, you have to make the decision to follow the commands of Jesus and get baptized for yourself. Okay, what about those born in the Middle East? They think their God is the right God. What makes you so sure you've got the right book of fables? I love the little, little dig at the end of that question. Um, just a little dig at Christianity. I know because I have seen... You can argue theology all day. You can argue about the Bible all day, but you can't argue with my life. I once was one way. I gave myself to Jesus Christ, and now I'm another way. And there is no one on this earth, in the heavens, or below the earth that has the power to change the human heart except for Jesus Christ. Think about it. The Bible is the only book that truly goes against all of the sinful, fleshly natures of man. It's the only book that truly talks about self-control every other religion in some way perverts and twists uh, uh, sexuality and all these other things they allow you to have sex with kids they allow you to have multiple wives they allow you to have premarital sex they allow you to what it's always something sexual with other religions why is it that Christianity is the one that goes against your very uh, human desires what people call human nature but it's actually a fallen nature and you have to get born again and when you do it's amazing that God puts new desires inside of you no amount of counseling or therapy or hypnotism or anything could truly change your heart only God can and for those of us who are Christians we have seen God's work in our lives that's how we know that he is true and the Bible says that if you seek God with your whole heart you'll find him and we've done that and uh, that's how we know answer me this why are Muslims converting in mass because they are having um, dreams of a man in white coming up to them and saying, I'm Jesus, you need to follow me, when they were diehard Muslims. Isn't that interesting? No one, no one, uh, no one can explain that to me. Okay, one more. Let's take one more. You guys are awesome. I'm just going to look through a couple of these questions. A lot of questions. Oh my gosh. Okay, this is a good one. I'm going to end on this one. They said, what is the first thing you do when you begin to lose faith? Uh, when you begin to lose faith, it's because you are looking at yourself. When you begin to lose faith, it's because... You are looking through life, you are looking at life through the lens of how it's going or not going. And you begin to assess who God is and how God is based on if your life is going good or if your life is going bad. When life is going bad, you begin to wonder if God's really there. And if God was there, I thought he was good. Why didn't he do something about this? And if he's really there and if he's really real, then why? You begin to lose faith. Remember that faith is believing in something we can't see or feel or touch or hear. Faith is the, the evidence of things hoped for, the substance of things unseen. Or I might have said that backwards. 
But faith is saying, Lord, I have no reason to believe in you right now, but I'm choosing to. Everything in my life is telling me to walk away from you, God, but I will not. So I think step one of losing faith is to just declare in the truth, in the, in the face of unbelief, God, I believe. Help me in my unbelief. Next, go back to what God has done in your life. Revisit the victories that you've had through God. Revisit the things that have happened that you can't explain that are only God. Build your faith again by seeing what God has done and believe he'll take you to another victory. And uh, the third thing I would do is worship. Even if you don't feel like it, when you begin to worship God, it's like you're breaking off a heavy yoke from yourself because you are incapable of, um, of, of holding on to two feelings at one time. You can't hold on to belief and unbelief at the exact same time. So when you worship, you're releasing faith even though you might not feel it. And I believe something powerfully is happening in the supernatural. Amen? All right, guys. Hey, thanks for watching. We'll do this again sometime. It's time for me to get off here. But bless you guys. Love y'all. And uh, we'll see you next time.